must ask themselves what makes the West believe that it can bully the rest of the world and decide what other countries should look like. Point three, I would like to substitute the present occupation. To see that happening, we must have something that gets into the vacuum, if you will. Something that is entirely different. Something that is benevolent, respectful, and symbolizes partnership and cooperation with the Iraqi people. This will be a peace-building mission never seen before in the world. It will be much larger and it will be different. Point one, it will be run by the United Nations, the finest organization we have if we want to make it that, with the best charter that humankind has. The important thing is that it should not do that alone in the usual way with short-term mandates and no funding. This should be a lead agency for an international peace-building mission under the UN leadership, consisting, for instance, of the Arab League, the OSCE, the European Union, the Organization of Islamic Conference, the African Union, the Gulf Cooperation Council, as governments, if you will, but then also as, and that's the important point, supported by NGOs. There are things people know in the NGO world that governments don't understand. And rebuilding civil society is a role for NGOs in the world and not for governments who are destroying civil societies as a profession. They've done it in Yugoslavia, they've done it in Somalia, they've done it in Afghanistan, they've done it in Iraq. Point two about this mission. It should be composed of 20% robust UN order organized military, 20% police and 60% civil affairs people and other civil humanitarian staff. In other words, the schwerpunkt of this, the, 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 the basis, the dominant component should be civilian, with some police and a robust military, uh, to simply pre provide a minimum of security. But not the way that most um, of these uh, missions are made today, where we see a heavy, heavy military, and you know, as, as, as kind of assisting in it, we see some uh, human rights monitors and things like that. No personnel of the military side in this mission should come from countries that have been occupied. There are enough other countries in the world who would deliver the military. I would like to see a high percentage of non-Christian and non-Muslim staff. I'm not saying none of them, but a high percentage of others, such as Buddhists, such as people from Africa, where the world community by its presence in Iraq would also symbolize and send the message to the Iraqi people that it's the world is coming now to help you get back to normal life. There should be a clear mandate decided not only by the Security Council, because some of the most criminal countries are on the Security Council, but in, in some kind of cooperative efforts by the organizations that I mentioned that would be parties to this mission. But a clear mandate, a long-term mandate, and a clear distinction of what is this mission going to do and what is it not supposed to do. Next, it should have its funding secured for at least five years of operation and it will be very expensive compared to other missions because it will be the largest amongst most comprehensive peace building mission in the international community but it will be peanuts compared to what war costs presently the world military expenditures are 1100 billion dollars i would guess that for 11 billion dollars we could we could do this mission and finally the un should be in de facto control limiting influence by any single member state Point four, complete debt relief for Iraq. Now that has already been decided in July this year. What we must monitor now is that these countries do not reinstall the idea that Iraq is owing anybody in the world anything because Saddam accumulated a, uh, a, de uh, a debt uh, at the time. This cannot be, it cannot be accepted that the Iraqi people shall pay for what he did. Point five, economic compensation to Iraq, Iraqis, for the sanctions and the war. If we can do economic sanctions, we must also be able to do economic reparations or economic compensation, helping people to get back. I don't know how to do it. Maybe a, a new kind of fund uh, where Iraqis and NGOs in Iraq could apply for money or something like that. But it could also be a big lump sum, you know, $100 billion as a way of saying we did wrong. We are here to help you. Point six. Arrangements that will secure that forever the Iraqi oil, which is the main and only resource the Iraqi people can live on, is on the hands of the Iraqi authorities and Iraqi people. The 
present law in the Iraqi parliament says that a sizable proportion, some percentage, 10, 20, whatever it is, of all incomes from the oil in the future will go to international companies, such as British Petroleum. This is unacceptable. And it's indicative of why we are there. Point seven. Finally, finally, we must accept, respect, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution of December 1974, I said 1974, and the Security Resolution of 1991, stating that the Middle East shall be a zone free from weapons of mass destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, the only country in the Middle East that has this is Israel. And it is time to ask Israel to withdraw from the occupied territories and abolish its two to three hundred nuclear weapons. They are the main problem in the Middle East, not the presumed future non-existent today weapons of Iran and not the Iraq that had been disarmed completely by 1995 in spite of the fact that the Clinton administration continued the sanctions and therefore killed half to one million people more by the way, presided over by Vice President Al Gore, who got the Peace Prize, and who was also presiding over the destruction of Yugoslavia. I don't think peace movements around the world should let themselves be deprived of the uh, Peace Prize. Point eight. Reconciliation. Truth and reconciliation. Let Western politicians stand up somewhere and tell how they thought, how they were informed or misinformed, what they knew and what they didn't know. I don't want to put people in prison and all that, but I want some kind of justice, some kind of an open process that can rectify and give the Iraqi people dignity and recognition of the harm that has been done to them as a people. And I would love to see, and that's what we argue for in this plan, that there would be a public apology. There must be some politician, some diplomat, somebody who can say, we are sorry. Some of the most important words in modern politics would be, I am sorry. We are sorry for what we did. It didn't go the way we expected or wanted. 